All right. Well, welcome, everybody. A slight delay in the sound check, but um, welcome to this OpenShift Commons briefing. Today, um, we're going to get started pretty quick here. Um, the other day, CMAC, who's a product manager um, who I've been working with for uh, quite a few, couple of years now, um, did a two-minute talk on Helm 3 in OpenShift, and I decided that I needed more. So he's going to give us a deep dive on what's next in Helm 3 on OpenShift, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. There'll be live Q&A. You can either type into the Twitch um, channel or in BlueJeans if that's where you're listening from. And we will relay the questions or we'll open up the mic and let you ask the questions yourself. So CMA, take it away and um, let's hear more about Helm. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I'll introduce myself briefly. I'm CMAX at uh, Product Manager at Red Hat, uh, part of the OpenShift team. Uh, my focus is uh, the developer uh, related tools and flows, Helm being one of them, CI CD, and, and other areas uh, related to that. And uh, we have started supporting Helm on Helm 3 on OpenShift. So I'm going to talk to you uh, about uh, what Helm 3 brings to the table and what we're doing on OpenShift about it, hoping to show you a little bit of that in action also toward the end of the session on an, an OpenShift cluster that I have here uh, accessible for the session. So like very briefly, let me talk about what Helm is. Uh, I think most people uh, within the Kubernetes sphere know about uh, Helm, but to make sure that it's level the, the knowledge, Helm is a package manager for uh, Kubernetes apps. So you can describe your application, the manifest, the Kubernetes manifest that your application requires as a Helm package, and then uh, parameterize them and install and update these applications on, um, on any Kubernetes that you install. It's a very popular technology. It has been around for quite a while. And it has uh, become uh, the way to install apps, really, uh, on, on Kubernetes. There have been multiple tries on how to define applications and how to parameterize these manifests, and Helm is really the most popular one that has emerged as um, as among these solutions, even though that the other other ones are like JSON and the other solutions around are also still popular. But Helm has uh, emerged really as as the most um, widely used among these ways in these, these ways of defining applications. Uh, there are a couple of concepts uh, in Helm. Chart is uh, referring to the package that I was mentioning that when you describe your application, those manifest. Uh, you put them in a package that is called uh, chart, and you, these, these YAML files, you generally, generally parameterize them so that you can configure your application uh, differently in different environments that you deploy. Usually within your development environment, you, you would use a particular instance of a database, and in your staging and prod, it would be a different one. So your URL for that database could be something that you parameterize you know, as, as an environment variable in the deployment object, uh, and that deployment object is one of those YAML uh, manifests that is included in the chart. Uh, you have to put these charts somewhere as well, like when you want to distribute them. If I, if my application is built as a chart and I want to deploy, give it to the IT ops to deploy it in, in the production environment, staging environment, I have to somehow share this with them. A repository is a place where these charts are stored and they can be shared and distributed. Um, and release is the last concept we're going to talk about, is when uh, you deploy a chart, install the chart into a cluster, you will have a release of that chart. Uh, if you modify uh, that deployment and do an upgrade of the, the, your application, for example, you have another release. So every, every deployment of a chart into your cluster, that becomes a, a release, which, uh, which, which we'll look at a little bit later as well. Uh, but how does Helm work? And this is where the, the main difference really comes from Helm 2 and 3. A little bit of history here that Helm 2 was not supported in OpenShift. We generally had a, a uh, like non-production view or we did not recommend customers to use Helm 2 for in production environments. And the reason for that uh, is that Helm 2 relied on a component called Tiller that runs uh, on the cluster as cluster admin. So you, as a user that I'm that is that has limited access to the cluster, I'm a, I'm a developer. I have only access to the namespaces that my application is deployed. 
I could ask Tiller to deploy a chart uh, into the cluster. I, as the developer, I have limited access. Tiller is cluster admin, so I could abuse this access that Tiller has and ask it to install things that I personally don't have access to install, right? So this is became a, a conflict of, it's become a problem for production environments, right? Because you, you want to close the production environment down, you want to control what gets installed on it, but uh, using Tiller, using Helm 2 would have opened the door to anyone installing things that they are not supposed to do on the cluster. And I'm trying to simplify uh, the issue, the, pri the, the security issue with Tiller, uh, but that uh, that that more or less captures the problem that existed. So we generally did not recommend customers to use Helm 2 uh, in uh, in production clusters. And a lot of customers, a lot of users of uh, Helm 2 still use Helm as a template engine or uh, within like non-production environments. Uh, but that has been uh, really the, the main reason that we did not bring Helm 2 as, as a supported component into uh, OpenShift, even though customers could still use Helm 2 on OpenShift, but uh, we, we were not endorsing it. Um, uh, when, when it comes to Helm 3, Helm 3 has a, a different mechanism for deploying charts and the Tiller component is gone. So what it really happens, as you can see, uh, on the slide is that you have the Helm chart, uh, which is those manifests that uh, I described, uh, the manifest for your application, this is the deployment YAML, this is your service YAML, the ingress object, the config map, and you have uh, certain values, which are the actual values that you want to replace in this parameterized manifest, right? The URL of the database, or if you want to replace the image tag that needs to be deployed. So these two gets combined, uh, the result of that is a set of Kubernetes manifests that can get deployed into the OpenShift, into the Kubernetes or OpenShift uh, clusters, and a release object is uh, is created. And in Helm 3, the only component required to do this for you is the Helm CLI. All of this is happening on the client side. Not, nothing is running on the cluster to do this for you. In the Helm 2, there was Tiller running on the cluster, so on OpenShift, uh, there would have been a Tiller component, that runs as cluster admin, you pass the chart to it, you pass your values to it, Tiller combines these two, generates the manifest, and deploys them into the namespace. And, and hence the, the security issue on Helm 3, you don't have that anymore uh, on using the Helm CLI, and as a developer, when I use the Helm CLI, so my security context is used, I only can uh, deploy components that I have access to if the chart includes um, a, a resource that I'm not allowed to create, then uh, the resulting manifest that is applied to Kubernetes um, or OpenShift, I would immediately get an error, right? Because uh, the cluster, cluster doesn't really care that this manifest is produced uh, by Helm. It sees it as any other mani Kubernetes manifest and the uh, RBAC model, the security model of Kubernetes would immediately complain about it. So that's the the huge difference between Helm 2 and Helm 3, and uh, this has been a very positive change. Many, many customers, many users in the Helm community had asked for this, for the removal of Tiller, and this happened on version 3, which we welcome as well, and has been uh, addressing the issue that we had for the longest time, which let us, enabled us to bring Helm to Helm 3 to our customers on OpenShift as well. Uh, on the slide, you see also an image repository update because all Helm does is that it converts those templates and values, the configs, into a set of Kubernetes manifests. But the actual application is the images that you need, and they, they still have to get pulled from uh, an image repository like uh, Kuwait.io or uh, Factory or Docker or Hub or somewhere else. So they get pulled by those manifests like any other Kubernetes manifest, right? You, there, there's no uh, difference really. The release object, why do we have those in Helm? They, they contain the metadata about what happened, right? So in the release, you would know that it was this particular version of this chart that was deployed at this time. And these are all the configuration that were applied uh, at the time. So after you, you deploy a chart, I still can manually use kubectl or OC, go modify these objects or edit the YAMLs, reapply them outside the Helm context, right? So a release object in Helm 
uh, contains what those manifests look like at the point that were deployed so that uh, this information can be used during the upgrade, for example, if the live object has changed from what, what uh, included a release. So to summarize, release contains all the metadata about uh, at that point that a chart was installed into the namespace on a cluster. Uh, so what else has uh, changed uh, between Helm 2 and Helm 3? So we talked about Tiller. That's still the largest piece of that. It's a very positive change. Everything on Helm 3 is on the client side. All you need is the Helm CLI and you're, you're good to go. Um, the, the second change is that it's, it comes together with the removal of Tiller is that that, that meta release metadata that was mentioned uh, this is managed as secrets uh, within the namespace in Kubernetes. So before in Helm 2, uh, Tiller was the central component that was aware of all the releases. So Tiller uh, included that information as well, what releases are have happened on this cluster and chart. And since this was a central component, you had to have unique release names across the entire cluster, which was a little bit difficult. On Helm 3, releases are just a secret. So all that metadata is encoded as Base64 and put into a secret into uh, the namespace that you have deployed the chart. So again, you don't rely on any central components. You're, everything you do is on client side. Um, and uh, the Helm 3 uses standard Kubernetes objects for uh, storing the metadata about the releases as well. So you can, if you're curious, you can just use kubectl and get the look at the secrets uh, within your namespace after you, after you deploy the chart and decode it to see all that information related to uh, to, to the actual release. It's a, it's a very long uh, JSON file. I think like during the demo, I can uh, show you that as well. Uh, the third point, what's, uh, what else is new in Helm 3? It's an introduction of library charts. So in Helm 2, there was a need to uh, share certain manifests or um, uh, like uh, logic between uh, multiple Helm charts. Uh, they, so uh, this, this was done in Helm 2 as well, but in Helm 3, it is recognized as a library chart. So it's a first class citizen. A library chart is a type of chart that does not deploy anything. It's only purposes for other charts to include it uh, and as a dependency, and it's uh, it shares uh, for for sharing common functionality between between multiple ch charts that are uh, related to each other. Uh, Three-way strategy merge is uh, another thing introduced in Helm three. It's very helpful, especially uh, with appearance of uh, projects like Istio, or if you're using Vault for injecting secrets into into your namespace or pods. Um, in Helm 2, uh, when you, so a release, uh, like we talked about, it captures the metadata when the chart was deployed into the cluster. Let's say you, uh, a month later, a couple of weeks later, you have a new version of your application, a new image for your application, and the configuration has changed also slightly, so you get a new version of your chart, and you want to upgrade your application through Helm to the new version of the chart. In Helm 2, the way upgrade happened is that it looked at the release metadata to see what kind of manifests were generated for the application. And it also looked at the new version of the chart to compare these two and adjusted your live application to the new uh, manifests that are included in your chart. Uh, this all looks good, uh, except that um, using something like Istio, the manifests that are live on the cluster slightly uh, differ from what is included in the release. So uh, imagine that you have um, uh, set auto uh, injection on your namespace and you're using Istio. So for every deployment that you have in the namespace or for that particular application, you have a sidecar uh, that is injected into a deployment into the pod by Istio. Uh, the chart obviously does not know about it. So there is no trace about, no traces, no information about the sidecar the Istio uh, proxies in the chart manifest in the release. So you have a release that doesn't know anything about a sidecar and you have a new version of your chart, you deploy, you want to upgrade to it. The new version also doesn't know anything about sidecar. So what usually happened during this upgrade is that those changes that Istio had done uh, on your on your pod, they all get overridden and get removed when you do the upgrade. So it creates a little bit of uh, uh, clash there. And there are other projects that have the same pattern. Like if your vault I mentioned does the exact same thing, you're injecting 
in injecting secrets. So pod, the, wall, wall, the wall controller also would inject a sidecar into each pod. And a helm upgrade would override, it would remove the sidecar basically from your application and would create issues. In Helm 3, this is addressed by a three-way strategy merge. So what does three-way mean? That every time you want to upgrade a release in Helm, uh, Helm looks at the release metadata that you have, what manifests uh, were generated for the application that you expect to, to be on the cluster. It also looks at the new version of the chart, what manifest you want to go to, but it also has a third pillar, the three, that's why it's called three-way, it looks at the live state of the application, the live state of the objects in the cluster, and merges all the three together instead of ignoring what's live on the cluster and only look at the release and the new chart for creating a new manifest. So the three-way strategy merge makes sure that if you if there are live changes on the cluster, if Istio has injected sidecar or something else has made changes to, to those objects, they get preserved when you do an upgrade. It doesn't override those ones. Next change, uh, this is, uh, we will look at a little bit more in detail about it also, is the Kubernetes security model. So Helm 3, everything is on client side. You are just generating a set of manifests that get applied uh, on, the, on the cluster. So every object that you create that follows the Kubernetes security model. If you are creating an object that, you're, that your user account is not allowed to, uh, you, would, uh, you would get an issue there because Kubernetes would just not allow creation of that object. So let's say you are not a cluster admin, but you are creating a, a, a CRD or a, a cluster role. Um, Kubernetes will return an error that you don't have access to create that, even though that is included in the chart. And that, that was possible before with Tiller because Tiller had access to everything. Uh, in Helm 3, um, you have access, Helm has access to whatever you have as a user. You can't go beyond your uh, uh, security context. CRD installations are simplified in Helm 3. They are more recognized and the ordering is simpler to control that the CRDs get installed before the rest of the manifest that you have. Uh, Helm Hub is a new piece. It was actually has been around uh, for a while now, but uh, Helm Hub is launched as a central catalog for Helm charts. There, there used to be or there is still a central repo for all the Helm charts. Uh, with categorization of uh, what is stable, what is in the incubator, and so on. But more and more Helm repos have appeared. There are like Bitnami Helm repository, Helm chart repository, and there are a lot of other ones that every application has um, possibly their own chart uh, in, in, in a separate repo. So Helm Hub was launched as a central place catalog that indexes chart across all those Helm repos that exist. Uh, and makes it really easy to find charts. Uh, you don't have to go check these repositories one by one or expect everything to be existing in the central uh, Helm chart repo that has been used for, uh, for a long time. So uh, you would go to Helm Hub and that would, uh, it's easiest to search there and it will send you to other repo. Helm Hub does not host the actual charts, right? It's just indexing from the other existing chart repositories uh, out there. And even in Helm CLI, that default a central repo for charts is removed, right? There is a, there is no preference there. You have to manually go add the chart repositories that you want to use and uh, um, and uh, install the charts and pull charts from those repos. Uh, there is integration also to Helm Hub. So through the CLI, you can obviously search in Helm Hub. If you're looking for WordPress, it would tell you which repos contain a WordPress chart, for example. And the last bit and the piece that we are uh, really excited about at, uh, at Red Hat is the OCR registries as um, Helm chart repositories. This is an experimental piece. Uh, the idea is to use OCI artifacts for storing charts as well, because uh, chart repos right now are, uh, uh, it's a plain like um, index YAML basically uh, that uh, lists all the charts that are available in this repo and all the metadata around it, but there is no security model. There is no clear way how you add charts to this. You have to modify it, basically modify that YAML at the chart. Um, and it's not easy for a developer to be able to push in, uh, charts to it or interrogate the, uh, the repository. Using an OCI registry, uh, that would uh, piggyback on the OCI registry capability around the security model, the push and pull model, and, uh, and Helm charts would be, uh, you would 
work with him, Charlie, the same way that you would, you, you would do with any other OCI image, uh, basically. So make it really simple to have security model around uh, pushing charts to the report, pulling them and uh, categorize them and versioning and, and so on. Uh, and they have just recently added support for uh, Helm charts um, as also artifact in, in Quay as well is an area that is uh, that is emerging. It's not final because the spec is not final yet, but we're working on it and uh, we're looking forward to use uh, OCI register really instead of the existing model for, uh, for repositories. Uh, so what does this mean for uh, people, the, the, the large group of users out there that have, that have existing charts for Helm 2? Uh, how do they go to Helm 3? The, the statement there is that the Helm 2 charts mostly work with Helm 3. There, there is no reason for it. it's compatible with Helm 3. They wouldn't work, but uh, the only thing that you have to be careful is the security model. So in Helm 2, you, everything gets installed because the tiller had access to the cluster and Helm 3 a lot of those objects uh, might not be able to get created especially on OpenShift that we by default ship the platform as very secure and uh, the developer it, 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 like a normal user would not have access to change the cluster like make cluster decisions would not have not would not be cluster admin so you might run into some of those issues that you have to review your, your charts to make sure that the chart is not doing more than is expected for the person that is supposed to install it. So if the chart is created for the developer to install it, then have to make sure it's not creating objects that the developer doesn't have access to. Uh, that's the only point. There are a couple of ways that the migration can happen. You can run Helm 2 and 3 uh, side by side because Helm 2 is still using Tiller and every new chart that you deploy can use Helm 3 and use secrets for the releases for the, within the namespace. So that would, that would work. There is also a plugin that migrates. So you can, like if you, there's a window that you would not make any changes to the Helm releases that you have on the cluster. Uh, there is a plugin that migrates the metadata that exists in Helm 2 and extract from Tiller and create it as Helm 3 releases uh, within your namespaces. So that, that's also uh, available um, uh, for, uh, for you. Uh, what, what we are seeing as a very common pattern is to have that coexistent and gradually move deployments to Helm 3 and uh, uh, remove the Helm 2 releases to a point that there is no releases based on Helm 2 anymore. Uh, so I mentioned that uh, the security model is different in Helm 3 and in, we have to review them if you're bringing charts from Helm 2 to Helm 3. Uh, this is like a brief comparison of how, how the security model is different. So in Helm 2, you have the chart signing provenance, obviously, that uh, to make sure that the chart is coming from the the, the author that is uh, claiming uh, it's coming, and then you have certificate management around Tiller to make sure that Tiller is not compromised, and within Tiller you had access management, right? You could control who has access to what, and that was it. So and Tiller itself uh, is um, had cluster admin to the cluster. So if you pass Tiller everything was allowed really uh, to do on the cluster. Everything you ask it, it could do if Tiller was compromised. Moving to Helm 3, there is no Tiller, obviously. Uh, chart signing is still in place, so you have that provenance control. Uh, the rest of it is all Kubernetes security model, right? So you have Kubernetes RBAC if that's enabled. You have pod security policy, network policy, the certificate management, user management, service accounts, and so on. Everything that you do basically regarding your manifest uh, the, the, your application manifest on Kubernetes, your user access applies now to Helm 3 as well. And that's really, uh, when we talk about existing charts on Helm 2, that's really the area that requires more reviewing, right? Um, the, otherwise, the manifests are all fine, but uh, a lot of charts run into access problem when you install them through Helm 3 because suddenly um, you are limited to what your user has access to. You're, you're not cluster admin uh, anymore on the, on the cluster. Or if you're a cluster admin, you wouldn't see any difference really. Any chart that you deploy with Helm 2, you can deploy with Helm 3 as well. Um, all right, so let me show you a little bit what we are doing. I have some screenshots here um, to uh, show you in Helm in, in OpenShift console, but uh, I think it's much nicer to see it live. So as a part of the support on Helm 3 on OpenShift, we are also surfacing Helm more and more within the OpenShift 
console, especially within the developer flow. So in OpenShift 4, uh, what you can see on my screen, it, there are two perspectives, administra administrator and developer, and uh, the developer perspective focuses on obviously developer workflows. Uh, what we have started with is to add um, add the Helm charge within the developer catalog in, in OpenShift. So if I go to the add flows and choose a Helm chart within the, the developer catalog, which is the place, which is the menu, the self-service place for developers. As a developer, if I look for a piece of software, I would always come to the developer catalog to find and deploy them. Let me uh, remove the, uh, the type to Helm charge. You can see everything. Maybe I'm looking for a .NET application or I want to deploy a Java application. I can see different type of Java runtimes or OpenJDK and Tomcat and so on to find it here. So this is a self-service. So any developer wants to deploy content on OpenShift, they will come to the developer catalog. And Helm chart is recognized there as a new type of content. So right now there are, you can see a few charts that are available and you, you can add uh, more chart. This is backed by a Helm repo. So any, any chart in that repo would peel, get pulled and be displayed here and we are working toward uh, repository management really for developer catalog as well. So you would see the charts here. Uh, I click on a chart, a uh, little metadata. This is an example chart. So it's maybe a little empty link to the home page. Uh, if I click install, uh, so we talked about chart having all the manifest and we can configure it. This is the values YAML really. So I can add information and modify the behavior of this chart for deployment within my uh, namespace. Uh, and I click on install. So that would take that chart, download it from the repo and install it uh, on uh, within the demo namespace on my cluster. Uh, within the topology where you can see it's like deploying right now the manifest and, it, and, and they're gonna bring up the pod. Uh, the hill uh, charts are recognized uh, within the topology as well. Let me zoom a little bit. The nice thing about it is that when I click on it, it would give me a little metadata, but also it shows me the list of resources that are associated with this particular Helm release, right? So this is a Helm release. It tells me that this Helm release uh, that was uh, uh, created, uh, it included a deployment config manifest, a build config a service, image stream browse, and so on, and, and release notes if, if, if a chart, particular chart has release notes. This, this chart doesn't have uh, any release notes. Release node usually contains, like if you're provisioning a database, it would show the, the username here or password or credential or any other config object that you want to communicate to the, the developer that has deployed the chart. Uh, and if I go to the Helm section of navigation, I can see the charts are, um, the releases are listed there. So there is one release called Node.js XK. I didn't rename it. It was a default, my default name generated for me. And this is at our first revision uh, version of the chart uh, and application. And these are the releases. This, this information uh, was, uh, it, it used to be within Tiller and now they're managed as um, secrets within, uh, within the namespace. So if I look at the secrets within this namespace, you can see that there is um, a, a type of secret called Helm uh, release v1. Look at the YAML, it's a long um, uh, encoded uh, data here. It's a large piece of information that is encoded in base64, and that's the rule is if you decode this in base64 uh, twice, because this is a secret, you would see a large JSON that includes all the manifests and so on. You normally don't do this, I'm just showing you to like how, how this is different from Helm 2, uh, but that's really how, uh, how releases are managed. And, uh, these are like regular Kubernetes object, right? So there is no central piece that is managing this. And if I use Helm CLI, I would get the same information about a release. Let's take a look, see if uh, the chart is deployed now. There we go. It had a build. This particular chart had a build config um, to, to build the image from source from me, showing the, the logs of the build. Um, let's go back to the topology view. I zoomed out. There we go. And uh, it is now deployed, a pod is uh, running. So let's do something else. Let's go to the, to the release and I wanna upgrade this release to a new version of the chart. Uh, I actually don't, don't have a new version of the chart right now. It's only the, the version that we had, but what we can do is to 
uh, modify uh, some some information about uh, this um, this this chart and uh, redeploy that. Uh, so upgrade is not only upgrading to a new version of the chart. You might just upgrade the configuration values of that particular release. So I'm going to upgrade this to the pull policy B uh, always. Always download the Nginx, Nginx uh, image and upgrade that. So when you when I do upgrade, it creates a revision of that uh, that release and it would uh, redeploy those um, uh, the images that I have had with the new uh, new pull policies. If I click on the release that I had now within the revision history, I can see that a few minutes ago, less than a minute ago, I, I upgraded. Uh, this particular release with uh, with modified uh, modified values and in the resources tab obviously I can see all the objects that has been generated by this release so this is very handy uh, if you want to see everything that is related to your application to this release when I deploy the Node.js application I see the everything and that, that is generated and from there I can navigate to those particular objects uh, for the release. Go back to the revision history. Uh, after I made a change, I changed my mind. Uh, if I don't want the image to be pulled every time. Uh, we can, from right here, obviously, like roll back to uh, a particular revision that was uh, deployed before. So I go back to the first revision of this release, uh, ask for confirmation. Uh, so it, I rolled it back to the, the first relay. So um, this is uh, nothing new for if you are familiar with uh, with Helm. Uh, this is the the release upgrade rollback on installed capability, and just uh, trying to show that we we are surfacing more of these these capabilities uh, in console. Um, uh, what we're planning to do next is uh, to focus a little more on. Uh, on the repository management. So right now, when you get OpenShift, uh, there are a set of created charts like this uh, IBM products uh, in the developer console, uh, and there is a way to modify this list, but we want to enable uh, admin to add multiple chart repositories and OCI-based uh, chart repositories uh, into um, OpenShift console, console as the backing repos and uh, automatically get pulled and get displayed here. So give admins a way to create a Helm chart that they want to develop that they want to add to the developer catalog and make it and make them available to um, to to their application teams that want to deploy. Um, all right, let me go back and uh, talk a little bit about Helm and operator. This is a question I get a lot. Uh, that uh, all right? How you're doing? You have been doing operators for a long time, and there are a lot of uh, talks of what operators do. How does this relate to Hail, and what does it mean for OpenShift to support Hail? Uh, Hail and operators, uh, and I, I put it as Helm and operators. A lot of uh, people ask Helm, what's the difference of Helm versus operator? These are really two different technologies that solve two different problems, but there are a certain level of overlap there. Uh, in, in operators framework, we have five levels of maturity for operator, and this they, they map to the different levels of day two operations that most organization has to do. The first one phase is that when you install the application, the second one is upgrading it. The third one is that when you manage the life cycle of it, the storage, maybe you have to back up the data, put it in the storage, be able to restore that data. Imagine it's a database. Uh, phase four is uh, when you are collecting metrics about an application that is deployed, and based on those metrics and alert, you make decision on how you have to maybe shard the data. You have to reschedule the way that your pods are scheduled. Like you're, you're taking action based on the metrics that you're getting out of the application. And the last bit, the higher uh, level of maturity in operators is that when you have full control, you have uh, you're hundred percent managing that piece of software automatically through the uh, uh, through an automated piece of software. So you're tuning the, your database based on the usage pattern that you see in the application. You're adding more resources to the database. You're uh, uh, proactively finding issues and try to fix them uh, within the database or within that application. Uh, so and and not all uh, and and these are all. Type the activities that uh, that IT ops is doing today about, about our applications, right? These are nothing new. Most IT ops are focused on exactly these activities activities because they have to run 
critical software in production. Uh, what operators do is that give a path to, um, to teams that produce software to automate all the way to the, that highest level of maturity to autopilot by encoding that knowledge into software that does that. So you deploy your application uh, as an operator and that operator would install it. It would also upgrade it. It would upgrade the data. It would back up the, let's, let's go like continue on the database example. It would back up the data of the database into storage. If an issue happens, it would restore that. It would look at the metrics. It would give you uh, guidelines on how to tune it. If it would sometimes even apply that tuning itself. It would process the workload. It would add more maybe memory and CPU and figure out how to shard the data automatically so that your application performs best, right? So all the focus of operator is on what happens after I have deployed the application. Helm, on the other hand, is a really nice way to package an application and install it. The entire focus is how do I go from these images that I have to describe the application completely of what it is and deploy it in the cluster. And I can obviously upgrade it, but upgrade is mostly focused on Kubernetes manifest. And you all know that like upgrade is very different from update. If you have a database deployed on Kubernetes, just updating the, the deployment and to refer to a new image of that database doesn't really do anything for you. You have to look at a data, export the data, reshuffle it, normalize it, import it back. There are a lot of like database processes around the upgrade. So that's the really main difference. Helm is focused on update, but operator can do the upgrade on, on all those automation. They are two different technologies, but when it comes to the install, obviously both operator and Helm can do install application, but that's just something that operators have to do because they want to get to all that day two automation that applications require, right? Their, their purpose is not to install software, their purpose is to manage software. Well, Helm is focused on installing software. And you see some operators out there that actually use Helm to install the application and then um, use other mechanism for the other levels of maturity that it requires. They keep monitoring the deployed application, the deployed chart, they get metrics out of it, they modify the tuning and so on. Uh, so they are uh, they are complementary technology that target different uh, different problems. Uh, I try to like a different view of showing that differences as well. That Helm focuses on like packaging, application installation, and simpler updates. Obviously, you can update your Kubernetes manifest. And operator, the entire focuses on uh, on capability that are related to that are look like managed services that you want to run your software as if it was a cloud service as if it was a managed service. So you want it to automatically upgrade the data and normalize it and adapt it and backup and recovery and do reshuffling of the pods and uh, influence the scheduling of the pods based on what's happening in your application and auto to unit. Um, so they, are, uh, they work together really well for the purposes that they are uh, created. And for most of the software that you buy or re reuse as services to that are consuming your application, like the database, like the message broker, like the cache, uh, they belong, they are, uh, they require capabilities that the operators can, can offer. And a lot of the applications that you build yourself, custom apps, and you deploy and you develop on your laptop and you deploy into the dev and stage environment, those are usually things that you, the Helm chart might be a very good uh, point to, to start with. Um, and there is actually, if you have a Helm chart, an uh, operator SDK offers a path that you can turn that Helm chart and create an operator based on that uh, as well. Uh, and with that, I'll, uh, I, I'm going to finish and want to leave some time for Q&A with the roadmap that we have. So OpenShift 4.4 was just released, Helm 3, we have announced GA support for it and all the capability around console. Uh, as we are going toward uh, 4.5 and 4.6, we're focusing on uh, the repo management uh, that I mentioned, and also like start exploring multi-cluster um, uh, workflows around Helm chart. When you have a chart that you want to push to multiple cluster at the same time, and uh, make sure that they stay in sync across the, all these these clusters based on a configuration that you have uh, you have defined. Um, and with that, I'm going to pause here to see if there are any questions that come up so far. Well, I think you, you um, did a great job 
And it was much better than the two minute version that we got a week and a half ago internally, so thank you. Um, and I think you also answered in the last slide, if you go back one slide, the first question that somebody asked, is this available in 4.3? And um, he was asking in terms of, he's running I think 4.3 on IBM Cloud right now and wanted to make sure that he could do what you're talking about, um, or at least part of it, um, in 4.3. So the distinction between what's available in 4.3 around Helm and 4.4, I think you tease it out there nicely. Um, and that person, let me just see, that was, I'm going to unmute you, Carlos Santana, I love that name. And um, if, you, if you'd like to follow up with that, you had a couple of other questions, Carlos. See if you can, there you go. All right, uh, can you hear me now? Yep, absolutely. Oh, yeah, hi, uh, thank you for, uh, for, the, um, for, for the presentation. Um, I wanted to see what the, what's going on with the Helm 3 and OpenShift. So, uh, Samik, uh, what what do you recommend in terms of GitOps? Um, like I saw you editing as a sneaky SRE the YAML directly on the OpenShift cluster. Hopefully, this is not a production cluster, right? That you're editing by hand your keyboards, right? Uh, but uh, that section of YAML that you're showing is that the values that YAML that uh, someone would put kind of in a git, git repo and then have something like Argo. So I was more interested, you mentioned something about in Helm 3, that uh, three-way merge of taking what is installed, uh, compare what is uh, the new version, kind of the upgrade mechanisms. Because uh, we're currently using um, a GitOps controller, right? uh, in this case, Argo. Is Argo using leveraging that Helm 3 logic to do that? Um, upgrade or, or it's just a simple values.yaml or do you have any thoughts about, about like what what to put in the, the Git repo? Uh, sure, so uh, the, your first question, uh, right, so there are like two different, uh, there, there is a development phase when people deal with Helm charts and uh, maybe you want to deploy a database in your, um, in, in your namespace and the chart coming from somewhere. So that's the view that I showed that you deal with the values YAML. That was values YAML in that, uh, in that uh, YAML editor that you looked at, you want to modify, you want to, you keep iterating on that locally. And they, they, the OpenShift cluster might not do local, but you're, you're locally developing code and you need to iterate on the deployment of the chart and modify it. And maybe you're creating the chart yourself. So that's really that use case. For production, uh, you're absolutely right that all of that, both the chart itself and the values YAML, that has to come from a, a place that is version controlled. Uh, it's, it's very common that you keep that in, in Git. You have different values YAMLs for different uh, type of environments. Uh, you might apply them through your CI engine, Tecton or Jenkins or something else, or like you mentioned, more of a, a GitOps uh, engine that syncs your repo. And I know that that Argo CD has, uh, that recognize it has a Helm um, applier thing. I forgot the terminology that Argo CD uses, uh, that, um, that would recognize the Helm chart and takes the values YAML from your repo and deploy it. As far as I know, uh, because Helm 3, I, I think I didn't mention that throughout the session, uh, in addition to the CLI, also comes with a client, uh, a Go client, to make it really easy for other tooling to uh, to provide what the Helm CLI does uh, through, uh, through their own uh, interfaces. So I'm guessing that that's what Argo CD does, that is using uh, the Go client or possibly Helm CLI. So I wouldn't expect any differences in the way that merge happens uh, when you're deploying a Helm chart through Argo CD versus if you're doing it through Helm CLI. Because they would not, uh, it would be, um, uh, I'm, I'm fairly sure that they are using one of the paths to, to Helm to, to, app, to convert the chart and, and values YAML to the actual manifest. They're not doing it that themselves, they're relying on the Helm CLI or the Go client of, of the Helm. So you should have identical results if you are using Helm CLI and do the merge yourself, do the upgrade yourself. Thank you. And and for the specifics of when you add, you did some edit and show some YAML, is that a, a um, cause I didn't see a kind on that YAML. Is that a CR that is in the cluster now or is that, what uh, is no. that, that YAML that you showed? 
let's take a look at it again. So uh, when I'm installing the chart, uh, this is the pure values YAML, right? Uh, it's, it's not a CR or anything. You, have, you should just have a, a, yeah. exactly what's in the values YAML and that gets replaced into, into the chart. Yeah, but this when you go to, structure? no, when you go to Helm and, and you see did some edits there, where, where's that YAML story in etcd, for example? At this YAML? Yep. Where, where is uh, that YAML is... stored in the cluster in etcd? Is it a custom resource, custom object? Is it a config map or a secret? Uh, this, is, this is the secret that I was showing you. So this is, um, uh, this is stored in, uh, in, uh, in etcd, but this is not a custom resource. This is essentially a different ah, representation secret. of the they secret, show up the secret data. Helped. Right. Uh, we are just surfacing the information, extracting it from the secrets and visualizing it in a way that is um, that is comprehensible in the UI. I see. It's it's not it doesn't contain good. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't want to take a lot of time, Dan. Sorry. It, it, um, uh, you've been warned. I, I talk a lot, but that that's okay. That was very interesting. Um, yeah, secrets is not something that you put in Git as a kind. I was thinking of a config map, but yeah, if it's a CR, it's a secret, I guess it can be put, but make sure that they're either still secrets or there's no uh, credentials, right? And then you can sync them from, from Git. Uh, right, so the, the secret, you don't really need to put them in Git. This is, this is just the mechanics of how Helm 3 works. So every time you deploy a chart, the release object is stored in the namespace as as a release, so this this you wouldn't put in the uh, in in Git repo. What you would get in, put in Git repo is your charge and the values YAML, and then Argo CD in your example installs the chart in into the cluster. Then one of these secrets automatically get created for you by by who by the Go client help Correct. utility. Okay, I yeah. See. So either by the CLI or by the Go no operator. Uh, client. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. And Carlos, I will make you talk. So <clears throat> we'll have you back on a couple of other topics uh, that I know that are near and dear to your heart sometime soon. Um, so watch out. Uh, Eric uh, had a couple of points. Um, and if he unmutes himself, uh, maybe. Hi, uh, yes. Uh, Eric Erlinson. I work with uh, AICOE. And um, I was curious. So we had done some work with, I don't know what to call them, it's the old style. OpenShift templates for uh, Honda. And of course, one of the features of that is if you define one of those, it'll create sort of like this little web form in the console, right, for people to fill in all those values for the template parameters. Um, I guess I was just wanting to clarify, like with this new Helm 3 uh, template stuff, um, is there going to be like a way to fill that out in the console or is it expected that customers will when they want to create one of these actually have to use the command line to do that uh, very good question and uh, the, the actual should have mentioned this before but I'm glad you brought this up so uh, the, the exactly like you said so this YAML is is very error prone if you have to modify this and a lot of charts so let's look at one of the other charts that we have I keep going to this one. Uh, when you look at the, the YAML, it could be a very, very large YAML, right? And keeping all the indentation, it, it's, it's difficult uh, to do that. So one of the things we want to do, uh, which was made possible in Hint3, is to, uh, similar to what you expected from, like you have seen in the, in the, for the templates, we generate a form for this particular YAML that it can enter the values there. And what has made this possible is that in Helm 3 for every chart can contain a schema for the values YAML. So it could, uh, it would contain a schema that would say for the, there is a field called server name and the title is this, the description is this, it accepts the strings between eight characters to 100 characters. So you can easily generate a form for that with validation and everything. So this, this is one of the things that we are doing uh, going forward. Uh, I did, didn't have a timeline, so I didn't put on a roadmap to communicate it now, uh, but it's definitely one of the areas that you want to add and replace or give the option to go back and forth between a form and these values uh, YAML in the YAML editor. Okay, cool. So it's basically, it's on your roadmap somewhere to do that. Yeah. That's great. Exactly. Thank you.
I'm going to unmute Balajay so he can ask his, his question next. And um, if you're not talking, just mute yourself and you can always unmute yourself and come back in and follow up. So Balajay? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, hey, Sam, a very great presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, with Helm 3, obviously, there is an official support from OpenShift. And operators have been our uh, favored uh, way of deployment. So how would be the messaging would be, and how do you foresee the ecosystem play out uh, in the sense that do you think people will use uh, Helm 3, what it's uh, uh, capable of in terms of initial deployment and updates, and use continue to use operators uh, to do what it does best? In other words, do they use the tools that are best suited for the, what they do, or do you think one people would like to choose one or the other? Um, it, it, this is also a very good question. I definitely uh, see this as uh, uh, that people would pick what fits their their use case, and this is something that we are already seeing. Like if you um, if you look at, uh, I have to go to the admin um, uh, console, look at the operator hub, and the like the, the, the pieces of software that are made available there. Uh, let me like uh, pick uh, like an example, like the, the database, uh, uh, CockroachDB, right? So there is a Helm chart for CockroachDB as well, and I can use a Helm CLI to, to deploy it. Uh, but from after I do deploy it, uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on managing CockroachDB. I know how to use it in my application. But I don't really know how to manage the pods, make sure it's running. Uh, within development environment, it's fine. But if I want to run this in production, I don't know how to do that. So an, an operator seems a lot more suitable here. And uh, that's why an operator is created uh, for it. And like it's relatively adding more maturity so that it can do more capability uh, around it. <clears throat> but imagine a case that I'm building a, the payroll application within our organization or some other application. I don't have a good example right now. And uh, this changes on every release a lot. So it, it is not a piece of software that is consumed by other development teams within their software, but it's only, but rather it's consumed by the users of, of this software through the web UI that it offers, right? So uh, the the are the the type of operation that it needs it it varies a lot from version to version every change that we make it's not simple really to have a fixed set of automation rules for how to manage this payroll application so in these cases uh, making creating a piece of software that can manage the, the payroll application might not be reasonable because you have to constantly modify that piece of software it's used only once for one deployment uh, a chart might be a lot more useful here, but something like this database that is installed thousands of times across thousands of cluster, all of them managed the exact same way. Uh, it's, it's very reasonable to have an operator that does this instead of all those thousand teams have to reinvent the wheel, go learn how to manage CockroachDP and, uh, and the operational, uh, develop the operational capability that they need to run CockroachDB in, the, in, in production. So, I definitely see that is already playing out uh, that way. That a lot of the, the 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 software that you see coming out as operators, they already have a Helm chart, but there is a need for them to automate the day two uh, uh, the operation that uh, that people have to learn, and they start creating operators for it. Yeah, thank you so much. Very nice. Thank you so much, Jim.